Good morning. It is Friday morning and time for devotions. A few particular prayer requests du jour. Um, would really appreciate prayers this afternoon for friends and family of Gary Freeland. Uh, Gary will be, uh, we will be having his uh, memorial service today. That is going to take place at 5 o'clock at the um, uh, at the Flemingville Church, and uh, so uh, would appreciate prayers again for those who will be doing that service and for those who will be attending, friends and family. So please keep Gary's friends and family in your prayers. Also, my sister Robbie, uh, she has she's had a lot of eye issues uh, over the years, as significant kinds of things. Uh, this happened to her once before, but yesterday she tore her cornea. Um, it, uh, without going into any details, very, very painful and very, very, um, takes a while to heal and a lot of, uh, a lot of effort. So, uh, if you can imagine the, uh, fact that, uh, your eyes use a tremendous amount of energy and, it's uh, uh, that's that's going to be something that's going to be kind of an overwhelming part of her life now for a while. Um, please pray for Robbie and uh, and the healing of her eye and uh, and the healing in other ways as well. She's just gone through a tremendous amount of physical issues in the last really three years. So um, please keep her in prayer. Thanks so much. And uh, just a, a reminder, um, uh, David Dewey Wright's dad, Jerry, is still in hospice care. And we uh, would invite you to pray for Jerry and for the family. He's, he's, my understanding at this point is he's continuing to do pretty well. But um, hospice care is hospice care, and it's that for a reason. So please keep the family in your thoughts and in your prayers. And, of course, Jerry as well. Well, let's go ahead and get into this. Um, we're going to be reading from Romans 8, uh, one of the great chapters of biblical reality. It, uh, it really, it, it, and, and it's a, a particularly good chunk of it. I don't know how you, how do you get better than good, but it's, it's, it, it'll speak to you, uh, I guarantee. So let us do our invocation. Pray with me, would you? Lord of life and love, Help us to worship you in the holiness of beauty, that some beauty of holiness may appear in us. Quiet our souls in your presence with the stillness of a wise trust. Lift us above dark moods and the shadow of sin, that we may find your will for our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You know, the invocation, just, just think about it for a second. Help us to worship you in the holiness of beauty that some beauty of holiness may appear in us. You know, so, so recognize that reality of God, uh, that holiness and the beauty therein, in such a way that uh, it enables us to receive from God a measure of holiness and therein to uh, demonstrate the beauty uh, of God to the world. So, uh, let's take a look. We are going to be reading from Romans chapter 8, as I said, and we're going to be reading verses 18 to 25. And again, remember that the theme for the week is thirsting after God. And uh, so let's, uh, uh, let's read these words of Paul. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation for the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, 
grown inwardly while we wait for our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. May God add his blessing to this reading from his word. Uh, first, of all, first of all, Paul is recognizing the fact that this wait does not just involve uh, happy, happy, joy, joy days. Uh, but rather there is suffering. And in point of fact, the suffering that we experience in the world t today as Christians is something that is um, a part of the reconciliation of our souls with God, but also of the world with God. Um, Paul has gone through tremendous sufferings in his life at this point. We know a lot of the sufferings. Uh, we're told he you know, brings us a list. At one point, you read Acts and you can see some of the things. He was subjected to the 40 minus 1 lashes. And, and just, again, a reminder, and you've all heard me say this many times, they called it the 41 minus 1 lashes because that's exactly how many they gave, 39. And the reason why was most people who got 40 lashes died. Most people who got 39 lived. It was literally being beaten within an inch of your life and typically had permanent effects on the human body and life. The fact that he went through it more than once uh, suggests a miraculous work, really, of God because typically uh, you were never the same afterwards. And Paul comes back from these things. So he's been through that, uh, this incredible brutality. He's been shipwrecked a number of times, uh, floating around on the open ocean for a time. That uh, is not something that people typically live through either. Paul has, uh, has been stoned and left for dead, and he has survived. He's been, you know, beaten within an inch of his life. And uh, it, it's just remarkable. Paul has been jailed again and again and again, and, and illegally in most cases, and, and certainly unjustly. Uh, it was a reaction to Christ in him by people who did not want Christ in the world. And so, you know, when Paul says, I consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us, he means it at a level that you and I can scarcely understand. Um, but Paul means it. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing and where this really plays out. Because he talks about he talks about creation and he talks about where the world is, where it's, you know, been and where it's going. And he refers to basically the, um, the futility at, at the present time. And I don't know about you, but it's easy to, uh, to turn to that word uh, in our own lexicon right now, isn't it? You know, futility, the futility of creation. It's like so many things are wrong. And we just, we have no capacity for changing that. We have no capacity for really correcting it. You know, we can we can play games, we can do all kinds of little things, but ultimately the true healing of the world is only and I and when I say the true healing of the world, I'm not, I'm not let's let's break that down into two parts. One is the world itself, not human beings. But uh it was subjected to this futility. The world itself was subjected to this futility, not of its own will, right? but by the will of the one who subjected it. Now, ultimately, that you can lay that at Satan's feet, in a sense, as, as being one who, uh, who did the, the, the labor involved in, dis, in destroying the perfect relationship. But ultimately, folks, it's you and me. It is us human beings who chose ourselves over God our knowledge over God's knowledge, our wisdom over God's wisdom, as if, you know, as if our wisdom could come over God's wisdom. And so you have, uh, you go back in, in uh, Genesis and you see this occur. You know, God says, okay, this is the one thing you can't do. You can't eat this fruit. 
And, uh, and so what do they do? They get talked into eating the fruit. And, uh, uh, and you know, so, you know, Satan is a part of that scheme. Um, human beings comply and the world is thrust into futility because the world was created for the glory of and for the joy of God. And when you broke that relationship off with God, as human beings and caretakers of the world, we broke that relationship off with God in sin, and it has never been the same. Um, you know, and you can say, well, Jamie, you're just taking this all too literally. Well, baloney. No. The literal explains it all. It absolutely explains it all. And where we're at in this world right now, <clears throat> even, even within um, competition and anger and hostility between denominations of Christians, at least, you know, and then if you go even outside of Christianity, you get into a whole nother ball of wax where the world is, uh, is doing battle for supremacy of their religion. And, uh, and so, you know, we eliminate God from the equation and you cannot have a successful world. It will not occur. God chose to interact again and set up a system by which we could be reconciled to God. However, God himself is going to be reconciling the world at a point in time at which there will become a new heaven and a new earth that will be brought about by God in his love and in his, uh, his desires. He is not going to be foiled in his pursuit of perfection. And so where, where do we play into that? Well, we play into that as we look in, uh, you know, in this passage. Creation itself is going to be set free from the bondage to decay where did that come from? Sin. And we'll obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains to deliver us as the caretakers of this world. To deliver us from uh, an incomplete state that we are muddling around in like, a, like an infant in the womb. Without a real complete knowledge even, you know. But birth is going to occur. And... And at birth, we will be fully adopted by God. We will be recreated, if you will. We will be made new and perfect and holy in the eyes of God. And there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And there's going to be some massive, massive changes. Um, you know, we talk about the Green New Deal. It's going to be the Purple New Deal, the, the Royal New Deal, the one who is God over all of us. And at one level or another, we're all going to recognize that. And so it is not yet. And, and that's not an excuse not to strive for it even now in our lives and in the work that we do in the world. You know, there do, you don't ever say that Jamie said, well, it's not going to happen anyway, so, you know, it's, uh, it's okay. Your job as a Christian is to strive for a recreation in your own life, you know, and, and where that plays out is, are you hungering and thirsting after God? Are you hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Do you desire it at the very core of your being? Is it, is it the essence of your very life that you are hungering and thirsting after God? And, uh, and of course, that's the, you know, that's the battle that each one of us has within ourselves, striving toward that, and, and sometimes more and sometimes less. And, and so that's why Paul says, and we hope for it. We know we're not going to do it ourselves. We know that God is doing it in us, but we still mess up. And, and uh, you know, that's part of the nature of the human uh, condition. And I'm, that's not an excuse. You have no excuse for that. But the wonderful news is that God, in his grace, still reaches out to us constantly when we mess up and draws us back to himself. And so we hope for the day when we don't mess up anymore. Because when the world of human beings stop messing up and become completely subject to God, and we know when that's going to occur, when that happens... Uh, hope will be made 
fully realized. It will no longer be hope. It will be fact. But until then, we wait for it with patience as God patiently waits for us. And, uh, and, and we, we need to wait patiently, but we need to hunger and thirst after God, after his righteousness. Um, but it's coming. Make no mistake, it is coming. And it's coming not because God needs to go, and I was right all along. It's coming because, because God loves us enough to forgive us and to establish a means for us to be forgiven when we were wrong. And, uh, and, and to have in his plan a whole new creation which will finally fulfill everything that God had intended and planned for his original creation, knowing that this was going to be a journey that he was going to have to walk through with us. And that full adoption, folks, is coming. And that full perfection in Christ is coming. And eternal life, which is what we were created for in the first place, is coming. And until then, let us hope. Let us hope with joy. Let us live lives, even in the midst of the crap that goes on, let us live lives with confidence because this is a temporary thing. And let us hunger and thirst after God and after righteousness. So be it. Amen. Well, have a good, have a good Friday. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, see you on Sunday. Sunday we will be uh, finishing up our study on spiritual fruits. And we will begin to prepare to move into spiritual gifts. And, uh, and that will be further defined, not probably this Sunday, but the following Sunday. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to do a spiritual survey of spiritual gifts. And uh, I, I don't think that's going to be the, the, uh, the Sunday after this one. I think it'll probably be two Sundays away that we'll actually do that. You will have an opportunity to take a look at things and to have a sense of what it is that um, you know God is gifting you with spiritually as a part of the church, as a part of the body of Christ, as a part of the functioning reality of living out the hope. So uh, we have that to look forward to together, and uh, I'm, I'm psyched. It's, it's going to be a, a good run, a good run to the end. And, uh, yep, so... Um, Hang in there, and hopefully we'll see you Sunday, but we'll see you next Tuesday one way or another. All right, bye-bye.